Freedom is not free. Discover what it takes. It's time to tap and move forward. Welcome to another episode of Tap and Move Forward. I'm your host, Lynn Shelley. I am honored and proud to introduce you to Command Chief Master Sergeant Ronald Anderson. He is the Command Chief of the Air National Guard, meaning he is the highest ranking enlisted member in the component of the Air National Guard. He's directly responsible for all matters influencing the health, morale, welfare, job satisfaction, discipline, family support, quality of life, and professional development of more than 100,000 Air Guard members. In this interview, he goes into details of his unusual and remarkable career path, as well as his vision and ideals when it comes to leadership. For this episode's Warrior Challenge, the Command Chief talks about how his success came from building relationships based on credibility, and that credibility is built every day. Your challenge is to start a journal and write every day what you did to build credibility or ways you could have and would like to build credibility in the future. Creating a habit and documenting progress is a great way to hold yourself accountable while you build a new character trait. Without further delay, here's the interview with Chief Anderson. So Chief, I have to tell you, I'm so excited and honored to have you on the show. I really loved having you come and visit my my student flight and appreciated what you had to say. And I'm really excited to, to, to get to ask you questions and learn more about you and leverage that for my, um, for my listeners. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I, um, getting out to visiting wings and, and actually talking to student flight when I'm doing that is one of my most favorite things to do in the world. Cause I, I look at it as, you know, that's the future of, uh, of our Air National Guard and maybe who knows whatever else they decide to do in their career, but, but that's really the future. So for, if I get just a few minutes to talk to them and kind of, you know, hey, this is what we need from you, um, it makes, it, it's meaningful to me. I, I certainly hope it is for them too, so. So let's start at how you got started yourself. Why did you join the military and how old were you? Yeah, that's an interesting story, at least from my perspective. Uh, I was, I turned 19 in basic training. Um, I, I grew up in uh, Southern California in the late eighties and, um, th there wasn't a lot going on. And quite honestly, a lot of my friends, you know, had, one of them had dropped out of high school and, you know, some of the other ones weren't doing very well. And I, I kind of got the sense that if I stayed around, I would probably follow that same path. Um, at, at least maybe to mediocrity at best. And, um, I wanted to get out of town. So I was, uh, one day I literally woke up in the morning and I said I'd had enough and uh, went to a recruiter's office and it was one of those outdoor mall, like, you know, the, there are four offices in a row and, uh, you know, the Marines was first and of course he's yelling at me and then the second one was like the Navy and come on in and I just I couldn't see myself on a boat for 20 years. Then there was the Army um, and it was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And the funniest thing in the world was the Air Force recruiter had a sign on his door that said out to lunch. And I figured, you know what? That's probably a place for me. <laughs> uh, so I went and did something else. And I came back in the afternoon. And uh, he and I just chatted a little bit. And, you know, I told him, I said, I'm a mechanic at heart. I grew up in a, you know, my stepfather had a body shop. And I knew I wanted to do something mechanical and um, started working with him. It actually took 11 months. Uh, for me to uh, to get into the Air Force. I had went and delayed enlistment for 11 months because it just in the 80s, there were just, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of money. So we just needed to wait until I found the slot. So um, really at the end of the day, I think it just came down to, I was looking for a, for a way out of Southern California and a way out of, you know, whatever else was going on there at the time. Um, it was no, I had no intention to be honest with you. I had no intention of staying for more than a couple of maybe four years. I just, I knew that if I could get away for a little bit and kind of get some new perspective, that'd be enough for me. So did you yeah, join 31 years later? So <laughs> did you join active duty? I did. Uh, yep. I went active duty, uh, which, and I did ended up doing that for 12 years. Um, I went to, uh, to basic training and I never went to tech school. I went straight to my first duty location 
Um, back then, you didn't need to go to tech school because you could, if you had a previous skill, you could test. And uh, I did that in basic training. So I went, uh, basic training was about six weeks back then. And in my, my fourth week, I took a, took a test. In my fifth week, I was told uh, I was given a set of orders by my TI. And I took 10 days of leave after basic training. And then I went straight to Germany as a you know 19-year-old kid. Um, which leads into a whole nother story that we can certainly talk about because I got myself in a lot of trouble, but, but, you know, 19 years old in Germany and we can imagine how that went. So, so what was your first job? So I, uh, I grew up, my stepfather in Southern California had a body shop. He, um, he only worked on hot rods. You know, he didn't work on new cars. He, he and my uncle both had, they had, they had two separate competing hot rod shops where they were building, you know, Corvettes and Camaros and Model T's and Model A's and the first car I ever worked on, gosh, I was probably 14, maybe even younger than that, was a 1940 Ford. Um, so I grew up at the beginning at the age of 10 sweeping floors in a body shop. Uh, so that's what I ended up doing. I went straight to Germany as an auto body guy. And uh, so I was fixing accidents, painting cars. Um, Weird. There's a couple weird things about back then. Auto body. We we replaced glass. We did upholstery work. You know, it was a little bit of everything. Um, but I really, really enjoyed it because I'm again I'm a mechanic at heart. So it was just kind of something that appealed to me. After you joined and started basic training, was there any big surprises that came to you as far as differences, discrepancies between what you thought the military was going to be like and what it actually was like? You know that I don't know because I I honestly, as bizarre as it sounds, I had no preconceived notions about what the military was going to be. I just didn't know anything. Um, I mean, I I was in the high desert of California at the time, and and both George Air Force Base and Edwards Air Force Base weren't too far away, and I remember seeing the airplanes, but that really wasn't what drove me towards towards the military. I just remember, you know, being a young kid and uh, being in my uh, my dad was born uh, in the house that he grew up in. Literally, he was born in the house in very rural PA. So even though I was born in Southern California, we used to go out there to Pennsylvania and I would sleep in the bed that he slept in when he grew up, when we would visit this little tiny twin bed. And on, uh, on two dressers, there was a picture of my uncle in his Air Force uniform and there was a picture of my dad in his Army uniform. Um, I don't know, maybe subconsciously, I thought the Air Force uniform looked better. <laughs> but, but that was about really the extent of my understanding of the military. So I literally just wanted a, to get away so bad that I was, you know, hey, the military sounds like a good idea and it's not what I'm doing now. So let's go try that. So your well, dad and cool. your uncle didn't talk a lot about their experience in the military? No, not really. My uncle was in for, a, for I think, he six years total, uh, most of it in Hawaii. Um, it was pre-me. And then my dad was only in the army for just a few years. I was pretty fascinated by it. And I didn't know this until later. Um, you know, he joined the army in the fifties and he spent most of his time in France, um, post world war II. kind of, he was a, a civil engineer kind of guy. Um, and then when he came back to the States. He was doing, um, you know, civil engineering kind of things. Uh, he did some, some work on the actual, the, uh, one of the, I think it's the, bridge the key bridge or one of the bridges he did some work on but again he was only in for maybe four years and, and not very long so they just didn't talk about it very much I think it's a little different than it is now back then I think everybody was in the military it seems like you know so it just wasn't something that was so unique that we talked about it you know and which is an interesting discussion in itself I mean there's so few people now who serve or, or even have direct family members who serve. But back then, you know, right after World War II and Korea and Vietnam, I mean, everybody knew somebody. If they were in your family, you knew somebody that served. So it just kind of became commonplace, I guess. So. And after joining, did you come across any big challenges? Yeah. Um, I, one of the things, as I said, you know, I went, I went um, straight to Germany at 19 years old and and I was still an absolutely a kid. I was not mature by any stretch of the imagination. And, and I had grown up, um, you know, my parents split up when I was pretty young and I, I was kind of on my own early in my life. And so I got to Germany and I didn't feel any constraints. The whole come to work on time thing really wasn't very interesting to me. And, 
you know, I could drink and I could do some things which, you know, we frown upon today, but, but certainly were a different time back then. Um, so it was very difficult for me to find my place in the Air Force, so much so that, you know, by the time I was a senior airman, I had already had two, two Article 15s. Um, which to, by today's standard, you certainly, uh, you wouldn't survive, but, but, uh, I used to, I used to like to drink a little bit and have a good time and fight a little bit. And, um, you know, so I, I really, really struggled with it uh, early on. Um, and if it wasn't for, for a couple of people, well, one in particular, I, I wouldn't be here today. And that was, uh, my commander back then was a Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and I will never forget him, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Ensweiler. He uh, was a squadron commander of a transportation squadron. And back then they were huge. I mean, we had hundreds of people in the squadron, hundreds and hundreds. And, you know, he took time out um, of his personal time to, you know, uh, he held me accountable, but he also kind of walked me through what it need, what it meant to be to be a contributing member of society. And, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. And we can certainly talk about that if you want, because I think that's an interesting story. But but that, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Ensweiler is why I'm here today. And, and I kind of, you know, I feel like when I wake up in the morning that I have to earn it every day because of him, because he gave me something that nobody else, nobody else did. And that's that idea of, um, you know, time, you know, he gave me his personal time, which is more valuable. You, you know, that's the one thing you can't get more of, right? I mean, there's, you know, gold and money and all that other stuff. You can earn more, you can mine for gold, all that other business. But, you know, as soon as time goes by, that's it. There is no more of it. And, you know, as a squadron commander, lieutenant colonel, he took time out of his family and away from everything else to spend it with me. Um, you know, he, my second article 15 you know, he, he took a bunch of money from me, which back then wasn't a lot. I mean, it wasn't like I made a lot of money, restricted me to base, um, did some other things, wouldn't promote me to senior airman. And, um, but on random evenings, he would just show up in my room and he would come to visit. Sometimes we would talk, sometimes we wouldn't. And, uh, you know, about halfway through my sentence, so to speak, um, he promoted me to senior airman and he told me that, uh, you know, there were three kinds of people in the Air Force, and he was going to help me figure out which one, you know, I was. And, and that was before the Air Force core values, because this is in, you know, 90, 89, 90. And, you know, he said there's the kind of person that's always in it for themselves, no matter what. They don't care about the Air Force or anybody else. He said there's the kind of person that, you know, does just enough not to get into trouble, but doesn't really contribute. And then he said, then there's the last person that does the right thing all the time because it's the right thing, regardless of who's looking. And, uh, and then he handed me a set of uh, orders to go to in residence, uh, professional military education. And that was, you know, like the following Monday. So I went from a guy with two article 15s to starting in residence PME a days later. Um, you know, and then a couple weeks later when I graduated, uh, from PME, I went from a guy with two Article 15s to somebody with uh, who had received the John Levito Award, the highest award for leadership that you can get. You know, and I, I won't tell you that I, you know, was trying to you know earn his respect or anything. I think I just kind of figured it out at some point that hey, you know, there's more to this than drinking beer and breaking things. Do you think it was? his willingness to really spend time with you that caused the shift more than what he said or a combination of the two that really you know i wish i could say uh, that i appreciated it back then or that i even really was cognizant of what he had done for me um I, because i but i can't i can't be honest with you and tell you that and and honestly it wasn't until I was being promoted to senior master sergeant. Did I ever reflect on it and go, wait a minute, there's more to this. Um, because back then, you know, going through that professional military education, back then we called it NCO prep. Now it's ALS. But, but even back then, I just, I felt like, you know what? I kind of get it. There was something that clicked, you know, the way the instructors um, were talking to me and, and they, they encouraged me to disagree. And that was the first time that, you know, in my military, my then short career, but that was really the first time that anybody encouraged me to say, you know what, I don't understand, help me understand why does it matter, right? Why do you even care what I do? And, 
And I kind of just found comfort in that, that somebody was willing to listen to me and, and that, and then he also helped me understand, you know, the thing that Colonel Ensweiler was trying to teach me. And that was that, you know, if you do it right, this, this Air Force family will give back to you tenfold to what you put into it. So, you know, I, I kind of started to figure it out, you know, at that point. Um, and again, it wasn't really until I became a senior master sergeant or literally the process of getting ready to do my promotion ceremony when I was trying to write a speech or whatever I was going to say did I really sit down and think about it. I mean, this that was, you know, 20 years later or 15 years later, where I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, I owe somebody for this. So. In the transition then, do you feel like ALS or your PME version of ALS? Yeah, yeah. Back in the cave, caveman days. Was it really just a, a beginning then of a transition or was it quite a radical transition? You know, I, I think, I mean, you could make the argument that it was a radical transition. I mean, I went from probably I should have been kicked out of the Air Force. I mean, by all intents, as I, I look back now, and if that had been my airman, you know, I probably wouldn't have wasted my time. I'd have been like, two Article 15s? Really? You can't show up to work? You drink and fight and break things? Yeah, dude, you got to go, right? Um, I would, I mean, it, it appears to be a radical transition, but certainly in my brain, it was part of an evolution. Um, and but having said all of that, you know, it's not too long after I graduated, you know, he's also the same guy that said, you know what, you're really good at your job. You just kind of suck at being a member of society. So let's help you with that. <laughs> um, and he, uh, he sent me to be an instructor to teach the course, um, you know, for basic, for, for tech school people right out of basic training. He taught, he sent me to be a tech school instructor, which was, I, I didn't want to do it. Right. I didn't ask for it, you know, and I barely wanted to stay in. And, and matter of fact, the weird thing is I had to extend to go do the assignment. And he talked me into it. He's like, no, you really need to go do this. And I'm like, but I don't want to do this. And you want to like, get well, out? Yeah, I, I thought I was going to get out. I was like, I'm doing four years and then I'm out. He was like, hey, just extend, go over, go over and try it out and get you. Because the other thing was, if I didn't extend, I would have had to have left the military in Germany because I had been there for three years and uh, I would have had to stay just for like another, I don't know, eight or 10 months. And then I would have left the military from Germany and, and, you know, and he did a good job of, of helping me understand he and the first Sergeant both that it would have, it would be really dysfunctional to just leave the military in Germany, fly back to the United States and be a civilian. You know, my transition would be almost non-existent, particularly back then. I mean, we just, we just didn't have the transition programs that we have now. And, um, and I think that appealed to, you know, because I realized I didn't have anything to go home to. Um, there was no job. My family was a little dysfunctional or maybe a lot dysfunctional. And so I was like, I don't even know where I would, where would I sleep? I don't have a house. I don't have an apartment. I really don't have a home to go to. And so it made sense to me. Um, you know, okay, hey, I'll extend. And then once I got into it, I really, really enjoyed, um, you know, being an instructor. And, and as weird as it is, I enjoyed the, the, the rigidity of the air education and training command thing. It appealed to my, what I didn't appreciate back then, you know, maybe my little bit of OCD, you know, my everything has a place and there's rules and that kind of stuff started to appeal to me. And I kind of found a, I found a home in that environment because I ended up extending to stay there and be an instructor. So. So the, the aspects that you were maybe a little resistant to early on in your career, when it became even more structured and rigid, you actually appreciated it. Yeah, as bizarre as that is, is you know, I, I, nobody's ever, nobody's ever reflected that back to me. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. I, I, I found a, a, some comfort in knowing what to expect, and that this is your left, and this is your right, and maybe that's part of why I suffered at the beginning because I had supervisors when I first came in the military that I. I I was good at my job. I mean, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I grew up doing it, right? So I mean, I kind of knew more, more than most of the people who basically had joined the military three or four years. They had gone to a couple of week tech school and all of a sudden we called them auto body. And I was like, mm, you guys don't know what auto body. Let me, let me explain to you what this really is. And, but I was unconstrained with my supervision. They, they, there was a little bit of latitude because I was good at my job. So they just kind of let me run buck wild. And now all of a sudden I'm in an environment where, you know, I'm being evaluated by, by senior instructors every day on how well I teach and, 
and I, and I understood what success looked like. I was being measured every day, you know, about, Hey, this is what success looks like. And if you want to be successful, do these things. And all of a sudden I was like, you know, that makes sense to me. I, you know, it's for me, I, I almost, it was almost like monopoly. Here's the rules of the game. Just do these things and you can be successful. I was like, Oh, well, that's a no brainer. I can just do those things. So <laughs> it almost sounds like, um, the, the value of the military structure wasn't fully explained to you or you didn't necessarily understand it until that point in your career. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, so if you fast forward now, you know, we're, we're having a conversation in terms of, of an evolution in training in the air force literally today. And so the AETC command chief and the chief master on the air force and I, and as well as the reserve command chief are having this conversation about, you know, how can we capitalize on, on the strength of the guard reserve, what you bring to the military before you join, you know, what is it that maybe you came in as a, you're a police officer and then you join the guard and they're like, you know, Hey, we're going to do this new thing. We're going to give you credit for a previous experience and you don't got to go to tech school. And I'm like, you know, Hey, like me, and they're like, no, 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 it's brand new. No, it's actually kind of not. <laughs> um, but one of my fears as we have this conversation and I've expressed this to chief Wright and Julie Gudgel, chief Gudgel, the ATC command chief that, while it makes sense in theory, from experience, I can tell you to go right from basic training right out into the wild is a little bit dysfunctional if we don't have structure. And, and I'm a testament to that, that if once I found the structure and kind of figured it out, I was like, okay, that makes sense. But I went from being in basic training, you know, locked down 24-7, 365 to literally no constraints and a paycheck. You know, I, <laughs> that was a little hard for me. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to set people up for failure, you know, as we get into the future. So I'm always thinking through what was my experience. Now, granted, that was my experience and mine alone, but I do think it's, it's worth the conversation. So, you know, at that time, yeah, I was in all of a sudden an instructor duty teaching and, you know, and I think the other part of it too, if I'm honest, is that, you know, my mom, my dad, my grandma, my cousins, I mean, I come from a long line of teachers, uh, you know, high school teachers and, you know, my dad taught college for a little while. So maybe there's some of that DNA in the back of my brain that that appealed to me as well. But for whatever reason, you know, I did it for a few years and then I reenlisted. And I think, you know, my dad probably was shocked more than anybody. You know, I went from a guy who probably shouldn't be in the military to now I'm reenlisting. He was like, you know, okay, you know, you kind of figured it out. And, um, but that does, I think that goes to, you know, I was more comfortable in that environment, maybe the structure of it. What, then later caused the transition from active duty into the guard. Yeah, I, um, notwithstanding that I kind of found some comfort in the structure of it, I also was a mechanic at heart. You know, I really just wanted to be a mechanic. And, you know, in the, in the Air Force, particularly back then, there was this up or out mentality, you know, and, you know, you needed to get promoted. And then once you got promoted, then you weren't really – working on the cars or the airplanes or doing your job, you were in supervisory role. And, and that wasn't really me. Um, I would rather um, be good at my job and then just naturally become into maybe a supervisor or whatever. But honestly, that just wasn't in my, my DNA. So I, I left being an instructor. I got uh, orders to Korea. And, and while I was in Korea, just really, it, it occurred to me that, you know what, it's probably time for me to move on. And, and quite honestly, I had no intention of joining the Guard as a long-term investment. I just, I knew that I could leave the Air Force early by, by palace chasing and, and then join the Guard for a short amount of time and then just be a civilian and kind of take the skills that I had learned and maybe go open up a body shop or something like that um, because of that appeal to me. I had, um, I had a little side gig while I was an instructor that my buddy and I, he was a fellow instructor, we were, we were building hot rods and racing cars in our off time. So that was like, you know, hey, I'll go back and do that. That sounded fun. And um, so that was kind of where my head was at. And, you know, the, the weird thing was one of the instructors that, uh, this was up in Aberdeen Proving Grounds, so it was an Army, Army uh, uh, schoolhouse, but there was a small Air Force detachment. And one of the civilians, fellow instructors up there, was this guy named Ken. And uh, I knew he was in the guard. I didn't know what he did. So I was in Korea on a remote tour up there. And I called Ken up one day from Korea. And I was like, you know, hey, man, um, 
I can leave the Air Force early, but only if I join the Guard. And, you know, I think I have two more years in the Air Force, so I need to do four years in the Guard. Can you help a brother out and give me a, help me find a position? And he was like, yeah, what do you want to do? I was like, yeah, I know, man, I'll try working on airplanes for a little while. Well, you fast forward about four months, five months later, my first drill, what I, the guy that I knew as Ken was that time, Major Kreziak, and he was my maintenance officer. So he's my boss. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what to do with this. Cause he's like, yeah, call me Ken. I'm like, uh, no, that's not how this works. You're a major crazy act. And, um, but he really kind of helped, uh, give me a soft landing into the guard and really explain, Hey, the guard's a little different. It's family oriented. And, you know, we have a civilian life and a military life. So that was kind of my first foray into the guard, but, but I'll be honest with you. I had no intention of staying. I was like, Hey man, I, I got like four years, uh, I'm going to do my time and then I'm out. So was it a difficult transit? I mean, you said he, he helped with the more of a soft landing, but were there other things other than, Hey, call me by my first name as an officer. Were there other things that were difficult in your transition? Yeah. Um, you know, my first drill was really bizarre to me because you got to remember I came from, uh, I think it was right about, I don't know, five and a half, six years in the area education and training command, which is a very rigid environment, you know, and these are folks right out of basic training. So if you're an instructor, you're expected to be very, very, um, you, you, to adhere to the standards to the, to the highest degree. And then I went to Korea and I was in a, I was at this place called Camp Red Cloud, which was an army environment. I mean, we were a small air force attachment. So we, uh, again, at the next level of readiness all the time. So I, I found myself um, high strung to a degree that I wasn't prepared for. And then I went to my first drill and suffice to say the guard was not what I, was not military maybe was what I was thinking. And I can remember my shop chief who was a master sergeant at the time. Um, I walk in and, and he just didn't look like the guy who I thought should be in the military. He just was not, you know, and, you know, he had the Tom Selleck mustache and the whole nine yards. And he walks me out to the flight line to show me the A-10s because I was going to be a, at that time, I was going to be a, um, a metals tech guy or a machine shop uh, guy on, on uh, A-10s. And I see this guy jumping out of the cockpit or, or leaning into the cockpit of an A-10 and he's coming down the crew ladder. Um, and he was huge and he was big. And, in the, and it looked like he was wearing a, a black morale shirt because we were wearing uh, BDUs back then. And I was like, oh, cool. We've got unit morale shirts. I'm going to get one, right? I want to be a part of the family. And then I got pretty close and I realized the back of his shirt had the Budweiser frogs on it. <laughs> like the, old, the old commercial Budweiser. And I, I am quite sure I probably went epileptic at the time. And, you know, my shop chief of the guy, I was a staff sergeant, right? So my shop chief was like, no, 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 it's okay. You know, we're different. And I was like, ah, we're not that different, dude. We're still in the military. And so my first foray into the guard was um, interesting, I'll say. Um, and it took me a while. Guys like, you know, Major Kreziak and then the guy that ultimately became my shop chief uh, or my supervisor really helped me to understand that, you know, Hey, we're different, but it's for a reason. You know, we're you know we're a traditional guard-based organization, and because of that, things are a little bit different. But you got to remember, you know, this was ninety-eight, ninety-nine, maybe. So we you know September eleventh hadn't happened. We were kind of still folks had replied, you know, talked about it as being a flying club, and you know we, we weren't as relevant as we are today. So there wasn't a lot of need to to be this level of readiness and expectation to meet the standards as we, as we do today. But it is interesting perspective, particularly in the job I'm in now, I look back on it and go, I can see the evolution pre September 11th to where we are now, you know, the COCOM requirements and all of that stuff. I think that's, it's an interesting perspective as the Air National Guard Command Chief, because I do know what it was like to a certain extent prior to uh, where we are today. What then caused you to decide to re-enlist if you had no intention of sticking around? You know, I, uh, I went, I was a traditional guardsman and I was, uh, my full-time job was working for CarMax. I, uh, and I actually did, I really liked the job. I, I wasn't selling cars. Um, I worked parts first and then I was in inventory and I really, I really liked the atmosphere because I was a car guy. I got to drive literally, you know, all kinds of cars. I got to do whatever I wanted. They gave me a lot of flexibility because I was more mature than the average employee, I guess. 
Um, but I missed, I missed the uniform one weekend a month just wasn't quite enough, if that makes sense. And, uh, I knew there was a job opening. And so I started applying and, and I literally applied for 13 jobs. Wow. Uh, and I, I had applied for everything. I was like, you know what, I'm going to try for every job. I mean, I applied for finance jobs and, and, uh, you know, admin jobs. And I, every, there was a job that I thought that I could talk my way into. I was going to apply because I, I liked the idea of getting back into the, to the military. Um, and then by happenstance, I was at drill one time and, and the shop chief who was running the structural maintenance uh, side of the A-10 said, Hey, I'm going to have a job open up and I think you should apply for it. And I, okay. Um, so I did. Um, and I got a phone call on a random Sunday afternoon one day, and it was the chief, the fabrication element chief. And he basically said, hey, so what'd you do this weekend? We talked a little bit. And uh, he goes, okay, so uh, we're going to consider that your interview. Um, you're going to wait tomorrow in a couple of weeks. And, you know, it was, it was just different back then. And, and I, I, I'm a, I benefit from having been hired that way but that's certainly not a good way to do business, right? I mean, I got the job because I had, I had demonstrated that I was willing to do anything. You know, I was like, you know, on drill weekend, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll go do that, you know? And because I'd been a drill status guardsman for a couple of years by then, and I was willing to do, go on orders and do whatever they asked me. And I really didn't care. If, okay, clean the bathrooms, whatever. I had done my fair share of that on active duty, so whatever. And maybe I had, I had probably um, established myself as willing, somebody willing to do whatever I could to, to just be value added. So it's, I'm sure that's why I got the phone call that I did. Um, but, but yeah, so I ended up going from a metals tech uh, machine shop person into the structural. Um, and again, it was the interesting thing was that phone call and getting that job was about the same time that the CarMax company said, Hey, we, we'd like to put you into the, the management uh, training pipeline. So I had to make a decision, you know, did I want to get into, uh, leadership in, in the CarMax company, or did I want to get back into uniform? And there was not, it, it took me about a nanosecond to make the decision that being a, uh, being a dual status technician. Yeah. I was a civilian employee, but I was still wearing the uniform Monday through Friday. That was a big deal to me. So I, I couldn't wait to get back in. Cause I, I, by then too, I kind of found my niche, you know, it made sense to me. You know, you were in the guard, you were recognized for your capabilities, not just how well you could read a book and pass a test and get promoted. And that appealed to me because I, I, I liked to believe I was a pretty good mechanic and people said, you know, Hey, there, there's a value in that. It's not just passing a test that gets you promoted, you know? So that made sense to me. And maybe that's a little bit of why I wanted to get back in. Cause I saw, you know what, this isn't the military that I thought it was. This is a little bit of a different mix of the military. Because you never were, or at least until this point, you weren't necessarily intending on sticking around in the military long term. Were you still really concerned about how you positioned yourself for promotions? Not in the least. I, I really wasn't, you know, and for me, I still had that idea that, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I want to get back in uniform. Yeah, I'd like to get promoted. I was a staff sergeant, you know, and I wanted to make tech sergeant. and but. It, it not immediately. And, and it, and it wasn't until maybe a year or so, maybe even two years later when I started to realize, because I still had that mentality in my head from active duty that, Hey, if you do a good job, you know, yeah, you can promote kind of outside of this structure where you have to wait for somebody to literally retire or die. I didn't understand that at first. I thought we well, I'll get back in and, you know, it makes sense to me and I'll work hard and, you know, and, and I'll get promoted. And then I, then I realized, oh, wait a minute, that, that's really not how it works in the guard, but it took me a couple of years to kind of figure that out. And it, and it wasn't that I was, um, uh, you know, disgruntled by that. It just, it were frustrated. It just, that was the different reality for me. It was like, now I began to understand, you know, the guard's a little different, you know, you, you know, one of the things that we value is experience and you get experience because you stay in the same job for a very, very long time. And that was difficult for me at the beginning. I, um, I, I struggled with, okay, well, what if I want to make master sergeant? And they're like, well, you're in a tech sergeant slot. I'm like, well, you know, I get that, but how do I make master sergeant? Well, you know, your shop chief just got in the job. So when he retires, you can compete for that. I was like, well, how long is that going to be? And he's like, well, 
he's an AGR and he's only got a couple of years of active duty. So maybe 15, 18 years. And I'm like, uh, well, I'm not sure I understand what you just said to me. You know, you want me to stay doing this. And I didn't even at that point, I'll be honest with you, I didn't understand the difference between, you know, dual status technician and, and AGR. I assumed there was full-time and part-time or drill status and full-time employee. And, it, and somebody said to me, hey, man, how many years of active duty do you have? And I said, oh, I don't know, like 12 years, something like that, maybe 10 years. And they were like, you need to figure that out. So I got my points calculated or my years calculated and it was like 11 years, eight months. And they were like, Oh, you need an AGR gig. And I was like, oh, you must tell me more. What is this AGR thing? Right. Um, and they're like, Oh no, it's active duty. It's, and it's the same retirement, same program, same healthcare, everything. It's just run by the state, run by the guard. I was like, huh, well, how do I get one of those? And, there, and it was kind of the joke, you know, you're not going to get one in maintenance. There's like five and you're not going to get one because you're new. So that, that, then all of a sudden I was like, well, okay, wait a minute. The game is different than I thought it was. Um, which led me into my next job, which was recruiting. Um, because I saw an opportunity, the recruiting supervisor had asked me to go with him and or the recruit, one of the recruiters had asked me to go with them on an event, you know, like at a high school or something because they wanted somebody in a career field to talk to people about, you know, Hey, are you interested in working on aircraft? Talk to Sergeant Anderson. He'll tell you about it. You know, then I would kind of give him my spiel. This is what I do. I work on A-10s and here's a picture and it's really cool. And, and then they were like, you know, hey, we, we're going to have a recruiting job open up and it's an AGR. I was like, wait a minute. That's that whole, I can only do, I can do eight more years and then I can retire thing. Yeah, I'm in on that. So that's really the, how easy the transition was. I, you know, maybe a, a year later I left maintenance um, and you know, I'm not ashamed to admit it, but I'm a little bit, it's kind of like I left maintenance because I wanted an AGR gig. Um, but then I, I really loved the recruiting atmosphere. I really did. I, I, I liked, I loved what we did. I loved the military. So talking about it made it sense to me. I guess I think of recruiting as being one of the most on top of it in the, like they have to be, uh, well organized and look good and on top of their uniform and like they kind of have to be the ideal e even in the guard you know <laughs> you have to yeah, the poster child right <laughs> so it makes sense that um given what you were talking about and like really excelling in that very rigid uh environment that the recruiting would be a great choice for you as well yeah it, it it made sense to me. And, and I, and I go back again to, you know, when I was an instructor, I was the lowest ranking instructor in the entire organization because in the army side, it was an army organization. You know, you had to be an E5 getting ready to promote the E6. I was an E4. I was a senior airman. And so I had to grow up pretty quickly and understand how to fit and conform into that peer group but it made sense to me um, and I loved it. And, but I also learned how to communicate um, with leadership and how to understand, you know, Hey, we're going to evolve the course material and this is what we're trying to achieve. So even as an E4, I was, I was rewriting course material. I was doing things because I understood, Hey, this is leadership intent. We need help to get these brand new airmen and soldiers. Cause I was, you know, with soldiers, Marines, it was international students. It was all kinds of folks. And, and so that absolutely played into when I became a recruiter, I, I already was pretty comfortable on the stage. You know, I was pretty comfortable talking about what we did and the get having leadership explain to me, Hey, we need more, um, crew chiefs and here's why it made sense to me because I was already part of that translation between leadership intent and, and action at the tactical level. I, I didn't, I, I didn't understand what it meant back then, but it kind of made sense to me. So when I became a recruiter, it was, you know, I, I innately understood that if you were coming to talk to me and you were like, you know, Hey, I'm thinking about joining the military. I, I could, I could kind of steer you towards, well, you know, right now what we're really looking for and you know, we're, we need mechanics and you know, I can get you some bonus money. You know I mean? It, it made sense to me. Um, and, and I, I think I did a pretty good job of it. It didn't last real long, but I did love it for the couple of years that I, that I was in recruiting. Because, you know, again, it appealed to my rigidity and my, my understanding of, of what, who we were and what was expected of me. What was your favorite argument for 
or the, your favorite reasoning for why somebody should go guard versus active duty? You know, I, I wasn't the, I wasn't the hard sell kind of recruiter, you know, and I, I wasn't chasing the, you know, we, you know, we called it goal, right? You know, you had a goal you had to meet, you know, whether it was three or four or whatever, every month you had to put people in uniform. And I was more interested in finding the person that wanted to be in the guard. And, you know, there were people who, who obviously did way better than me. You know, they were double in the goal, you know, eight a month. And for me, it was more, in, I was more interested in, you know, having the conversation with somebody, bringing somebody that I thought wanted to be in and that it made sense to them. And, and I had really developed a pretty, a pretty strong uh, relationship base with like the Navy recruiter or the army guard recruiter. And, and one of the guys I still talk to occasionally um, was at that time, he was the special forces army recruiter. So I'd have somebody coming into me and they're like, you know, Hey, I want to fire guns and I want to shoot things and I want to blow stuff up. And I'm like, man, I would love to have you in the guard. I think you'd be a little bored. I, I got a guy for you, you know, and I'd farm him over to the special forces army guy. And, um, you know, if you had, at that time, you didn't, if you had way too many tattoos, I mean, like, hey, I, I, I'd love to have you in, but unfortunately, this doesn't work for you because of the amount of tattoos, but I have somebody for you. So I'd call the Navy up or I'd call somebody else and I'd go, hey, I've got somebody who absolutely qualified. They want to be in. Here's what they're interested in. They just don't fit our tattoo policy. And, and, it, and it worked really well because I was able to trade back and forth where they would get somebody and they'd go, hey, this person wants to work on airplanes and I can't help them today you know, are you interested? And so we pull back and forth and that was a little dysfunctional to some folks because, you know, it was all about some people saw recruiting as pressure sales. If you can't, if you called my phone, I was going to put you in boots in the air national guard. And I said, eh, maybe not so much. Um, and that, that may have been a little bit of why I, why I ended up, ended up leaving recruiting a little bit early, notwithstanding that I loved it. I just found myself a little bit at odds with the leadership. You know, I, it, I, I was more interested in, quality versus quantity and those kinds of things. So I just, I, I found my way out to, to do some other things. I mean, that's a, a nice way of saying it. So then what would you witness as the number one characteristic of somebody that made them a good fit for the guard versus the other options? You know, I, I would love to tell you that it was a singular thing, you know, that there was a trait. And for me, it, it was more of a, a sense of who they were, what they were interested in. And back then, when you went to recruiting school, you know, they taught us to, to get to what they called the felt need, right? So I would ask you a question and you'd say, well, you know, I'm in, uh, uh, getting ready to start college and, you know, I don't have a lot of money. And I'd be like, okay, so what do you want to do? Well, you know, I'd really like to get into physical therapy or I want to be a FAA or whatever. And, and I would start peeling back the layers and then, then ultimately I'd go, so what you really are saying to me is that what's most important is that you want money for college. And you go, well, really, that's it. And I was like, okay. And then we would start having the conversation about, you know, does the job really matter or are you just interested in money for school? And really, do you like the school you're going to and you want to stay in Maryland? Well, that's important to you. Hey, guess what? I can, I can help you with that because I can give you money for school. You can serve on the weekends. And I can probably help you get into a career that is symbiotic with where you want to go in the future. Um, and then depending on how they responded to that was, was kind of how I, how I brought them into the guard or not. You know, some people were like, you know, I don't know. I just want to join the military. I'm like, eh, really? Because I saw it as an investment. By that time, I had figured out that the guard was a family business. And that if, if I was recruiting somebody, I was the Maryland Guardsman at the time. If I'm going to recruit somebody in the Maryland Guard, I will have to live with this person for the rest of my career. So it makes sense that I bring quality in because I don't want to leave it. And more importantly, the relationship that I had built across the, the, the rest of the wing, they'd be mad at me if I brought somebody in who, you know, turned out to be a shit bag, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So where did you go after recruiting? Um, I, I left recruiting rather abruptly. I, um, I'll delicately say I had a fundamental difference of opinion with my boss. Um, and I left recruiting and, and basically that night I went home and wrote a uh, hand wrote on a piece of paper that I'm resigning my AGR position and going back to traditional status and turned it in the next day. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was, 
let's suffice to say my then fairly new wife um, freaked out a little bit because I went from having a great job that was going to carry me through to retirement to no job. Uh, there was an emotional reaction, as you can imagine. Uh, sure. But I got to give her all the credit in the world. You know, she, she trusted my judgment. And, you know, she said, you know, hey, listen, if that's not for you, I get it. You know, and um, but I again, I, I had great leadership because I had a lieutenant colonel, um, then major Tanya Murray was her name. And she she sensed something was wrong. And I said to her, hey, I'm leaving. Um, and uh, she said, well, you know, what if I could help find you something else? And I said, well, you know, I'd, of course, be interested. And so she got me an ADOS gig that started you know, less than a week later, um, literally when I was in her office, she called a friend of hers who was a fellow major that was on a, a tour at the guard bureau and said, Hey, I got this guy. You can trust him. He's interested in coming to work. He needs a job. Can you help him out? She said, sure. I had no idea what I was going to do, but I went from no job to having an AGR title 10 ADOS job in the, at the Air National Guard readiness center. Back then it was in Crystal city. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just showed up like a week later on Monday morning. Uh, couldn't even get in the building. So she had to let me in. I was like, by the way, what am I going to do? And she said, uh, you're going to be the um, NCOIC of counter drug multimedia. I don't know what that is, but it's a J-O-B. I'll take it. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's just bizarre. But but I think it goes to, I had built a relationship and I had built trust in my leadership, you know, that, that a lieutenant colonel, well, then major was willing to just put herself out there for me and say, hey, I got somebody you can, that you should hire. So and interesting, I'm still friends with her, and I'm still friends with then Major uh, Nahaku McFadden, who's now a retired 06. She and I are still friends today because of those relationships. And how did you handle the transition? You know, I, I literally just, again, I think it goes back to I was given an opportunity, and I felt like I owed it to, you know, Major Murray at the time. I, I owed her. She, she put her name out there. I recognized that was a big deal. And uh, I just, I worked my butt off and said, I'll do, I'll do anything you ask me to do uh, because somebody trusted enough to put me out there. Um, I didn't know what counter drug office was, and I certainly had no experience in multimedia, but, but I was going to figure it out. Um, and so I did, I was, but I was only there for a short time. I was only there for about six months until I had an opportunity one day to go interview for a job um, that I didn't apply for to go be the executive assistant to the deputy director of the Air National Guard. And I, I don't know, I, I went from being a temporary employee to being direct hired into a stat tour program. But it was, again, it was based on relationships because there, I was a tech sergeant and I worked for a, uh, one of the master sergeants who was our admin person came to my desk one day and said, Hey, do you, uh, do you have your service dress with you? Yep. We're going to go and put, put it on. We're going to go upstairs to the 12th floor. I didn't re know that she had recommended me for a job. No idea what the job was. I went in and sat down with a full board colonel. We talked for a little bit and I interrupted her and I said, Hey ma'am, I, I, I appreciate this great conversation, but why am I here? And she says, well, the deputy director at that time, major general Akis is looking for a, uh, an executive assistant and, um, so it would be you and I and him working in this office if, if he selects you. Wow. And a week later I was working in his office and, and I say those, I, I tell you those stories very deliberately because I think it goes to this idea of, of being willing to do almost anything that was put in front of me. Um, and no matter what job I was given, and this goes way back to when I first came in, I was going to do it to my, you know, the very best I could. Um, irrespective of, of what I thought the job's value was, you know, even if I didn't see what, like, you know, cleaning the bathroom was a big deal. I mean, it sounds like a joke, but I was like, you know what, I, I'm going to spend the time to do it. I might as well do it right. And, and that has very, that has served me very well, whether it was going into PME or, or actually working in my jobs. I just said, I'm going to do it because somebody, somebody depending on me to do the job. And so that, that's kind of been, I think if, if you were, if you were going to ask me what one of the keys to my success or how I got where I am, I think it was that idea that I built relationships built on credibility and the credibility really is earned every day. Every time I show up every morning, every day, every afternoon, I just earned it every day or try to anyway. 
it, it's still a little bit of a fantastic story. <laughs> it's bizarre, right? It, 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 I look back on it now, I'm saying the words out loud. I mean, it is a kind of a bizarre story. I mean, it's not, it's not your standard, you know, you, you work in a shop, maybe you make senior NCO or you make NCO, you become a supervisor, then a shop chief. I mean, I didn't go through the standard, you know, work your way up through the wing to be the wing command chief and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That just wasn't my path. Um, but again, I think it goes to, you know, everybody, particularly in the guard, in the air guard, our paths, none of them are the same. You know, we, we, we go through these securitist routes where everybody's job and everybody's experience is different. And when I get out and I visit airmen, you know, when I was out in Utah, you know, one of my favorite things to do when I, when I talk to airmen is, you know, hey, who are you? What's your story? Where do you come from? You know, those kinds of things. Because everybody's just different. I mean, I meet people who are I met a guy not too long ago who had been out of the military. This is when I was up on May, in Maine. He had been out of the military for 12 years. He was in the Marine Corps for a handful of years and then just got out arbitrarily and then decided to come back in because he felt the calling to, to serve again. And, you know, and that, that doesn't, I think that's who we are as a guard. And, you know, it's just this, it's an interesting dynamic. We're, we're different from the active component in that way in that, you know, how we arrive at, at our, place in the universe is different in the guard because of, you know, our experiences are different. Your statuses are different. There's so many different ways that we can serve that it just provides opportunities to be a little bit more indirect in our path. What's your favorite advice to give new enlistees? You know, I think it goes to that idea that, you know, um, don't tell yourself no. And, and really what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you opt out of something that's put in front of you, uh, you may find yourself in a situation where that could have been the difference why you were promoted or why you were selected to do something. You know, if somebody offers you the opportunity to go do a job and you don't see value in it, maybe you don't have all the information. Maybe there's more information out there than, than you have access to. And, you know, if somebody says to you, hey, I, I think you ought to go to in-residence PME, and you go, you know what, it's not the right time for me. I, I get that. But don't discount the idea that maybe in residence PME will offer you something different in terms of relationships or whatever that the correspondence course will offer. And, and again, one's not better than the other. It's just that, you know, when you opt out of an opportunity of any kind, you, you say no to that experience. And so I urge folks to try to find a way to, to continue to find balance in their lives, but to explore opportunities, you know, um, to serve in other ways and, and really, you know, I could pull that thread all the way to being a command chief, you know, because if, you know, if I could even ask you, you know, when you think of who your wing command chief is or who your next wing command chief is, do you want a wing command chief who's only ever done one job? Maybe she's been in finance her entire career. She becomes a wing command chief and that's what she knows. She knows a little bit of MSG, but she knows finance. Or do you want a command chief who maybe her career has taken her I was in uh, services for a little while. I was in uh, finance for a little while. I went and served on the flight line and I understand what that's like. And, the, and then I went to joint force headquarters and I understand that. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, I deployed, you know, for a little while and, and you get this depth and breadth of experience that when challenges are in front of you that your airmen are facing, you're able to, to see the world a little bit bigger than it, than you would have if you were very, very, uh, uh, linear or very, you know, singular in your career. Um, and, and I think that's been, you know, if I'm able to pull the thread all the way through, I think that's one of the reasons I am where I am is because I, my career has been, you know, um, just odd and, and, but it's put me in front of, and, and I've had so many different experiences. You know, I left the Maryland guard and, and I left the, you know, the headquarters building and I went to go be the FSS superintendent in the DC guard. I am not a personnelist. I was never trained as a personnelist, but the DC Guard needed somebody who understood leadership. And I went from a person on the, from a flight line or from a mechanic perspective, throwing rocks at the support system, you know, hey, you're why I don't get paid right. You're why my promotion paperwork's jacked up. You're why, you know, I blamed everything on, on the FSS or the force support. And then I went to work there as a superintendent and I very quickly realized that, uh, you know, it's not that simple, you know, 99% of the time, maybe it's not that high, but, but certainly, you know, uh, 
90% of the time, the person standing on the other side of the desk um, doesn't have their crap together. Mm -hmm. And the FSS troop is trying to help, but you know, I, I understand that now differently. And, and again, I think that's, that's what helped me to be a good command chief is because I understood the, you know, the support side as well as the operational side. Um, so again, back to your question, um, I think if you tell yourself no, you've got to be willing to accept the fact that, you know, you might have taken yourself out of an opportunity that could develop you differently than, than your peers. And maybe, just maybe, that would have been the thing that had set you apart from your peers in being selected for promotion or an opportunity or something like that. And that, that's true of education, that's true of PME, that's true of, I mean, almost everything. I, I really appreciate that you phrased it, tell yourself no versus tell the opportunity or tell the Air Force no, but you've actually said tell yourself no. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very, I, I'm one of those folks that believe that, you know, you're responsible for where you are, right? And, you know, if I wasn't selected for a position, it wasn't because somebody else screwed me. It was because I didn't, I wasn't prepared or I didn't have the right experience yet or I had opted out of an opportunity that I shouldn't have that would have made me credible. And, you know, I, when I was a senior master sergeant, I was working for the director of the Air Guard and there was a job I wanted more than anything. I wanted to be the director, excuse me, I wanted to be the, the chief master sergeant um, working for the legislative liaison. I wanted to work, I wanted to wear a suit and tie every day, work on Capitol Hill and, and advocate for the Guard. And I put everything into it. But ultimately, I wasn't selected. And, and initially, I was mad at the guy who got the job. And then I had a great old crusty chief who was like, he asked me some really great questions. He was like, do you have your bachelor's degree? And at that time, I didn't. I was like, yeah, no. He was like, okay. Did you do this? Well, no, but I was really busy. I started making excuses. And he goes, hey, I'm just going to read this back to you. You made excuses about why you didn't have your bachelor's degree done. You made excuses about why you didn't do X, Y, and Z, and why you didn't prepare enough. Whose fault is it you didn't get the job? I was like, ooh, you know, that kind of hurts. And so that was a big lesson for me that, you know, if I'm not selected for an opportunity, whether it's a promotion or a job, the only thing I can do is look in the mirror and hold myself accountable to that because it's not, hey, uh, Lynn got the job over Ron. I don't like Lynn or she was a favorite or she, you know, she happened to be best friends with the person who was the shop chief. That may be true, but that's an irrelevant part of the conversation because I can't control that. I can only control myself and the things that I did to prepare for that job or maybe more appropriately didn't do. And, and I think that's one of the things that I see missing sometimes is we don't take ownership of the fact that we are where we are because of the decisions that we personally made. And, and that's a big deal for me. And, so back to the beginning, you know, you said, you know, uh, about, you know, my time with the student flight folks. And that's one of the things I like to remind them is you have control of your career. Don't let anybody else drive your career. It can, your career will either happen to you or you will, you know, or you will drive it. And, and I see a lot of people let their career happen to them and then they're mad at the world for it. And that's ridiculous. You have the ability to own it. You do if, if you only take advantage of those opportunities. And in the Guard, as you know, we have so many things that we can do, so many jobs, so many statuses we can serve, so many opportunities. They're, they're just, they're unlimited. And yet I see people limiting themselves. Well said. And honestly, I, I, that really ties into why I created the, the podcast in the first place, because I can see pieces of that in myself where early on in my career, I maybe let some things happen to me, even though I was the stereotypical excited airman that was ready to work and do whatever it took. There was still a piece of me that um, didn't necessarily see the bigger picture or even see outside of my shop or even think about other op opportunities. And um, there was a really bad bit, there was a really big transition for me uh, after I went to a leadership training that was an opportunity that was given to me that I, it, like, like you said, I was more than happy to take the opportunity and it had massive impact for me. Yeah. 
And uh, when I started to see, it's, it was a magical training that, that basically told, showed me all the things I could be doing to be taking control of my own career and to have a bigger impact on the Utah Guard as a whole. And doing that and seeing that changed the way that I engaged in my career and in my life. And my biggest hope is if I could give that to the rising ranks so that they don't just, like you said, let their career happen to them. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm 100% with you. And, you know, the fact that, you know, that you're taking um, ownership of the student flight and, and doing those kinds of things, you know, investing in the future. And I, that, that's one of the things that's really important to me is, as you and I talked um, kind of offline about, you know, hey, I've been in the job three years and this is kind of my last year in the job. I look back and I, I want to make sure that, um, that I've contributed something and help people understand that, hey, listen, I'm a guy with two Article 15s. I'm a guy who shouldn't be here. Um, but I, you know, we, we all get there differently, right? But I learned that, hey, at some point, you have to own it. And you've got to take responsibility for yourself and you've got to take responsibility for your career and you have to consistently do the very best you can. Um, and sometimes it's going to be hard. You know, you're going to have to deploy, you're going to have to make those hard decisions and you have to balance your family and sometimes, you know, negotiate a little bit of your family time and a little bit of maybe your civilian employment time. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're able to do that um, and you're able to contribute in a way that's meaningful, it will not only affect your military career, but it can also enhance, you know, everything about you. you you'll grow as a person. You'll be better at your interactions in your family. And certainly your civilian employer, if you're a drill status guardsman, will grow as well. And they'll start to see that you'll take leadership roles and leadership experiences in, in your civilian uh, capacity as well. And I think that's, again, you know, you know what, one of the benefits of being a, an Air National Guardsman is that, you know, there are a symbiotic relationship between those three things, you know, your family life, your civilian life, and your civilian employer, and the military. And then if we do it right, you know, those things are in right balance, and, and we'll continue to grow together. Uh, and that's where I've been, you know, I've been fortunate, because I've, I've been able to kind of merge those three things together. And, um, and it's, it's hard, right, because we have to negotiate you know, sometimes you give up, your family gives up something. Sometimes your civilian employer gives up something. And then certainly your, your military gives up a little bit of something. But, you know, if you do it right, it can be so, it can be such a rewarding uh, life in the, and family thing in this guard that we've got. Absolutely. So what do you enjoy most about your job now? You know, I, uh, when I think about where I spend my time and, and this is something that I talk to folks about when I'm on stage, you know, like when I was visiting in Utah, you know, or visiting in a wing, you know, I spend an awful lot of time on Capitol Hill or I spend an awful lot of time in the Pentagon, you know, having conversations with the chief master of the air force or our COCOM senior list of leaders, or even the secretary and, you know, whoever the folks in leadership, I spend an awful lot of time there. And that's important stuff because I'm, you know, that's my job, right? I have to advocate for the enlisted at the highest levels. But the part that I enjoy the most, quite honestly, is uh, when I'm walking through a, a squadron and, and there's a, a couple of airmen sitting around a computer or sitting in a break room and it's not on my schedule. Nobody, like I'm not supposed to do it because they're taking me into some formal meeting and I just veer off and I go sit down and I talk to two young airmen and I'm like, you know, hey, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? What's your, what's your story is typically what I do is I'll ask them, you know, Hey, what's your name? What's your story? Because, and that goes back to every one of us have a story that's unique. And that's my favorite part is to learn a little bit about who we are um, as guardsmen. I learn something new every time I do a visit. I learn something new about who we are. Um, the important part for me is not only, you know, does that help fill my cup, so to speak, but it also gives me fodder for when I come back and I happen to be meeting with the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force and we're talking about the future. I'm going to go, Hey, Chief, so just listen for a minute. That's a great idea, but let me tell you how that's going to affect this airman I met while I was out in, uh, in Maine or in Utah or in Texas. And, hey, you know, she's a traditional guardsman and, and you know, she's got her own business. Or, hey, I met this, this airman and he's a cop at his full-time job. And, and, and that's a great idea, but I'm not sure how that's going to work for these folks because I can tell your story. And to me, 
that's the exciting part is, is being able to, to sit and talk with folks and understand who they are uh, and then communicate that to our senior leadership, whether it's on Capitol Hill and our congressional representatives, or it's with uh, the, you know, Sergeant Major of the Army or the Chief of Staff of the Air Force and tell that story as well so that they understand that it's, we're a little different. Um, our dedication to our nation isn't different. Just how we arrive at, at, you know, performing our jobs is maybe a little different. That's the exciting part for me. So it reminds me, I was going to tell you when you came through our student flight and you were leaving and you shook my hand and my, and my counterpart, and then there was one student flight member that was standing there along the line and you shook his hand too. And, uh, oh wait, I think you, I think you got a uh, picture with him afterward, but as soon as you left, he looked down at his hand and he was like, he shook my hand. <laughs> you know, honestly, Lynn, that is the craziest thing to me because I, I, I see it the other way, right? I see, you know, that I'm humbled by the opportunity to spend time with the future of our Air National Guard. And, and I get it, right? I mean, I remember like, I would have never in a million years fathomed the idea that I would be able to call the Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force a friend of mine, right? That, that is a surreal, bizarre thing. And he's a great guy. But at the end of the day, I still see myself often kind of back to the beginning of the story. I still, still see myself as this young guy just trying to figure out what it all means and find a way to contribute. I don't know. I mean, I, but I think that's part of the irony as far as what makes you such an incredible leader is that even the new brand new enlistees can find you still accessible. I hope that's true. I mean, I, I, I do want that to be true because I, I try really hard to, to remind them at the end of the day that, you know, we, a lot of times we talk about the pyramid, right? That, you know, leadership's on top of the pyramid because there's a whole bunch of airmen at the bottom. And I try to communicate to them, not, not in a deliberate passion, but, uh, but I try to flip it upside down and go, Hey, you know what? You're, you're the one that matters. You're the one doing the job. I'm the one at the bottom trying to feed up, you know, this, this up to the pyramid, you know, I work for you kind of thing. And, and I'm not deliberate in my communication, but I hope that they understand that that's how I feel about it. That, and this, again, it goes back to, I've been so fortunate, you know, 31 plus years. I never, I shouldn't be in the job. I should have been out a million years ago. And I'm thankful every day that I get to serve because of people like, you know, Lewis Ensweiler or, you know, Nahaku McFadden or Tanya Murray or, or any one of the hundreds of thousands of other people that I've been in contact with. I'm grateful for those experiences and I try to pay it back every day. And um, I think the minute that I, that I see it differently um, is the very second it's time to <laughs> go do something else because it, it quits being exciting for me, you know. Have you found any books or documentaries influential to you in your career? You know, I, I have, I, um, and it's, as a side note, it's interesting. Um, I talked about my, my relationship with the chief master of the air force. He told me something very interesting, not too long ago. that was very empowering. And, and I had lamented to him that I struggled because I've got like five or six books started, but I couldn't, I can't get through them. Right. For whatever reason, I'm kind of stuck. And, and he goes, Hey man, let me tell you, um, I'll read a book for a little while. And once I've got what I need out of it, I'm done with it. And I put it up on the shelf and I change. And he goes, I don't feel bad about it because I got what I needed. And that freed me up to, to not feel so emotionally attached to, I started this book. I'm going to finish it no matter what, even if I find it absolutely pointless. Right. Um, <laughs> but so I, I find myself uh, approaching reading differently or approaching podcasts differently. And I, I don't feel this beholden idea or this idea of being beholden to it. So, um, but things like um, a book that really resonates with me is uh, I'm a Simon Sinek fan and, you know, he does the, I think it starts with why. Uh, yeah, it's up on my show. Yeah, it starts with why. And I, how the understanding and the importance of why people uh, want to believe, why they do what they do and what makes people um, want to be a part of an organization. All of those things are incredibly important to me. And I think about that all the time. And it's a lot of self-reflection too. 
Because to the truth is, I mean, I still wonder why it is I do what I do, right? So it's a little self-reflection and I'm trying to psychoanalyze myself. But it's always helpful to understand that and this goes back to the guard being we're so different is that every one of us has a different motivation. There's a different why we're in the Air National Guard. There's a different why we still serve in uniform. It's a different, you know, like the Marine I talked about who'd been out for 14 years. There's a different reason why he came back than, than somebody who's been in for 35 years and never had a break in service. And I never want to forget that part of it. So that's an incredibly important book to me. And so much so that, you know, I'm responsible for the, the, uh, the course that we have here. So when you make chief, when you make chief master sergeant, you know, you come here to the, uh, to their bureau for, for a week and I run that course. So I'm responsible. And that's one of the books I buy for every brand new chief is I, I give that to them as a, Hey, you know what? You, you need to understand that it's important for you to understand why your airmen do what they do. And it's a little introspection for them, hopefully. Um, you know, I've read his other book, you know, like, uh, one of the other was like leaders eat last. And I think we all understand why that's important. Um, there's been a, a lot of books, you know, that have been interesting to me, but, but all for different reasons, you know, um, there's one that I, or a movie that I've kind of been, you know, thinking back on and that's, it's a bizarre reference, but that movie, we were soldiers, you know, and I think back to, you know, Mel Gibson and, and, uh, and how he was as a commander and his, his Sergeant major. And there's a, like a leadership uh, 101 in the first 45 minutes of that movie. And, and as we have this conversation about readiness, I look back on that movie and I recognize that at the end of the day, you know, the Lieutenant Colonel, when he wanted to know how many, how many uh, soldiers were ready to go tomorrow or today, he didn't check his homework. He looked at the Sergeant major and he said, Hey, Sergeant major, how many do we have today? And the Sergeant Major was able to very quickly and very clearly able to tell his commander, this is how many soldiers we have today. You know, so as we bring this full circle, we talk about what matters today. You know, the idea that readiness is our number one priority as a senior enlisted or as an enlisted supervisor or, or an enlisted leader, it's my responsibility to own that part. So that, that kind of resonates with me. You know, my boss, General Rice, he should be able to look at me. You know, hey, Chief, we've got nine, almost 92,000 enlisted. How many do we have ready to fight tonight? And I should be able to tell him, hey, 92,000, boss, exactly. You know, unfortunately, we can't do that. And, and I think that there's a lot of reasons why, but that's one of the things that I'm working on as I get into the future is, you know, how can I get a better sense of who we are as, a, as an enlisted force and how can we build readiness and how can we leverage all of those tools and tricks that we have in our, in our bag, so to speak, to get our force ready to, to fight tonight. So that's kind of a, kind of a look into one of those things that I think about a lot. If you could go to yourself starting out your career again, is there any advice that you would give yourself? You know, I, I think about that one. Interestingly enough, I think about that a, a lot and, I would love to tell you, you know, hey, don't be a dumbass and, you know, drink yourself, you know, every weekend. But I, I would also tell you that I am where I am because of my experiences. And I don't think I would don't I don't think I would be the senior NCO I am. I wouldn't be I certainly wouldn't be the command chief I am without all of those experiences. But I I do see opportunity lost. I think I could be a fundamentally better senior NCO and a better chief um, if I had done a couple of things. And, and one of those has gotten my education earlier. If I had paid more attention to that, um, my civilian education, and, and that's not a, you know, that's not a statement about the value of the CCAF or the value of, of the piece of paper, but it's more of, I learned so much through the process of civilian education that I probably wouldn't have been so emotionally attached to my decision making. I, I learned that, you know, when you, when you believe something, it's got to be able to withstand the rigor of, of, um, of being able to go through and pull it apart and break it into the smallest pieces. And if you can't defend it through that process, then you, know, you might need to kind of check what you believe in. And, and that process of getting my undergrad degree in particular helped me understand that that rigidity of, of writing papers and then defending those papers. And then sometimes through that process, I realized I was wrong. What I thought I understood or what I thought I believed was wrong. And 
I could have benefited from that so much earlier in my career because quite frankly, I waited until I was a senior master sergeant late in my senior master sergeant uh, to get my associates or skip to my bachelor's degree. I, I would have worked on that much sooner. And I'll be honest with, with you, I probably would have my master's degree done right now. And I don't, and I, and I kick myself all the time because I, I believe that I could be a better leader with that experience of, of, and that process of going through and studying something like leadership or strategic change or whatever. And, and again, it's not the master's degree piece of paper. It's the process and the exploration of learning. I think that's the most important to me. Um, and I think that's particularly valuable as we get into senior NCO ranks and particularly in my job is that earns me credibility with my boss. You know, I mean, having that level of education, you know, again, this is not a philosophical conversation about the value of a piece of paper, but, but having that in my record and saying to my boss, yes, I've got this level of education is saying something about my ability to be critical and, and to, to critically evaluate and critically think. Um, I would be better at my job, I think, if I had done that earlier. Um, that's probably the, off the top of my head. That's one of the first things. And uh, secondarily, I, I would be, if I had the opportunity, I would uh, read more. Um, I'm not very well read in terms of some of my peers, and I regret that. I, I started late in my life. I think that I would see the world differently if I had spent more time reading instead of drinking beer. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm being honest. With the, all of your experience with leadership and teaching and leading, what do you see as the most important aspects of a good leader? Uh, credibility, and and I and I I say that you know um, because it's a, but it is a broad subject, and and what I mean by that is, um, I honestly believe that to be a good leader, you've got to earn it every day. It, it it's that idea, and I. I was it Colin Powell that said, or you know, I think it was Colin Powell that said, you know, if you think you're a good leader and you look behind you and there's nobody there, does it, are you really a good leader? And there, there's, I messed it up, but there's kind of the, the nuance of that. And I, I work hard every day to earn the right uh, uh, to lead the enlisted force of the Air National Guard and to be a credible leader with my boss and our airmen. Um, and it's, you know, it's everything, right? It's, you know, I'm 51 years old. I could easily take a pass on the PT test and, you know, and, and get an 80 and, and that's fine. But if I expect our airmen to hold, uphold the highest level of readiness, then I should expect that of myself. If I expect that, you know, um, people exceed the standards then I should do the same, you know, it's, we lose credibility when we opt out of those things. You know, it's not to do as I say, you know, not as I do mentality. It's you have to earn it every day. And I find myself um, sitting next to General Rice or the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Engel, or any of our senior leadership, and I have to earn the right to sit next to them or be a part of the conversation. And sometimes, quite honestly, you know, I've got to be, I've got to be uh, w as well read as I can. I've got to pay attention to the news every day. I've got to listen to podcasts. I have to. Um, I, I've got to do everything I can to develop myself across a spectrum, right? And it's this idea that it's easy, and this is not a political statement by any stretch, it's easy to be comfortable and say, you know, hey, I'm on this particular persuasion, I'm only going to watch Fox News because it appeals to me. Well, I, I'm sure that makes you feel comfortable, but that doesn't tell you, um, that doesn't give you perspective on how other people think about that same problem set. You know, if the president says X, Fox News has a perspective and MSNBC has a perspective. And it's incredibly important, I think, that as leaders in particular, that we open up our aperture and are willing to expect or willing to accept the fact that other people have a different opinion. And if I want to help my boss make a decision or I want to help my boss understand the complexity of some of these things that we're getting into, I also have to understand the complexity of the world that we live in. And, and, it's, and it gets me out of my comfort zone uh, and, and, and it's hard work. And I urge people to do that. I urge people to get out of their comfort zone and, and have conversations with people who don't look like them and act like them or from where they listen to the same music that they do and all of those things. Um, because ultimately it helps you see the world a little differently. And that's what it, that's that idea of credibility because it, when you come to the table, you're not only speaking from this very myopic, very, you know, linear old singular, you know, 
cylindrical of symbol, cylinder of excellence. You're talking from this broad brush, you know, hey boss, you know, here's what I think the answer is, but you know, don't mistake the idea that there's some risk here and, and this is how it will be perceived by this group. And I think this group will see it this way, but I do believe this is the right answer and here's why. This is the risk you will assume if you don't do that. And and I would I would tell us, I would tell the enlisted that starts at the first level of supervision, you know, at that senior airman who has finished ALS and who is now a first line supervisor all the way through to the chief master of the air force, because he will tell you that exact same thing. Um, you know, Kay Wright would tell you that being well-read and earning the credibility and having all of the education and all of that, it all matters because it goes to who you are and the credibility that you bring. Um, and you can't get mad, you know, if you don't do the homework and which just circles back to that other conversation because you lose credibility. And if you're opted out and you don't get to be a part of the conversation, it's your own fault because you didn't earn it. If you could take one superpower or skill set and you could just infuse all of the rising ranks with that one superpower or skill set, what would it be? Wow. <sighs> Belief that they can do anything. I mean, that sounds really simple, but I, I want folks to absolutely believe in their heart of heart in the Air National Guard that anything that they want to do is possible. And they may have dysfunctional leadership, they have, may have dysfunctional supervision, they may find themselves you know, in a square corner that they can't get out of, but I need every one of us to believe that you, know, you can do anything you want in this Air National Guard. Again, I'm a guy who's got two Article 15s. Um, if you work hard, Nobody's going to hand it to you, but if you earn it every day, I honestly believe you can have anything you want. And, and that's, it's not a superpower. I think it's just the ability to rise above your own personal experience and your own little box and see the world for what it really is. And, and that's one of the reasons I think that, that I love this business so much is that I believe in my heart of hearts that I don't care who you are. I don't care what you look like. I don't care who you go home to at night. I don't care what your AFSC is or what status you are. If you want to be a part of this organization and there's something that you want, you want to be in leadership, whatever it is, I believe you can get there. You just got to do the work and you got to earn it. So Chief, I know that social media, you have a big presence on social media. If any listeners are interested in following you, how do they find you? So I've got a, uh, a, an official page. So I think it's Air National Guard Command Chief. I think if you look that up or maybe it's Command Chief of the Air National Guard, um, if, uh, if there's a way to circle back with you to make sure we get it out there, I'll do that. Um, but I think if you just put Air National Guard Command Chief out in, uh, in Facebook, that's probably the easiest way. I've got a, a, a very, very small Instagram account that I really don't, pay, I don't get a lot of uh, attention. I don't, I don't put a lot of time and energy in the same with my Twitter account. My Facebook's kind of the comfortable thing to me because I'll do live Facebook feeds on there when I'm out, I think of something. And, um, one of my favorite things to do when I'm out visiting units is to take pictures of airmen and, and tell their stories while on there as well. So um, I urge people that I think that's probably the best place. And this, I'll use this opportunity too, is um, uh, we're in the planning stages of my next Facebook town hall live. And, and you know, I'm trying to find every way to communicate to airmen. And if, um, and, and, you know, Facebook is at the end all be all, but it is certainly a place where, uh, where I can connect to as many people as, uh, as are able. So in the up, I think it's, uh, well, I don't have the date in front of me. In the upcoming weeks, we're going to do another Facebook town hall live and I'll make sure it's on my, my official Facebook page. Well, thank you so much. This was an incredible interview. I have really enjoyed hearing more about your career. <laughs> and yeah. How fantastically interesting. <laughs> as bizarre as it is, right? <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate your time and your, your willingness to give back. So thank you for being on the show. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And, and I really enjoyed it. And I think at the end of the day, if, if uh, you know, one of your folks finds it you know, helpful in their career and maybe inspiring, then, then it's, it's, uh, it's worth everything we've done. Um, you know, thanks for what you're doing, too. It, you know, uh, you know, the, having the podcast that you have really focused on providing, you know, folks uh, opportunities to hear from different, folk, you know, positions in leadership and perspective about how that may, you know, benefit their career. 
that that's an important thing. And I think giving back to, to, to your airmen and really the rest of us is a big deal. And that's kind of who we are in the guard. So thanks for doing that. It's, it's meaningful and it's inspiring to me too. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And honestly, I, I think it's a little bit um, selfish on my part because I feel like I, I'm really lucky that I get to rub elbows with and to talk to incredible people such as yourself. I tell a number of people, it's amazing who will talk to me just because I have a podcast. <laughs> so, Be careful what you ask for, right? Because I have some friends that, you know, if you want hooked up, we'll see what we can do. Yes, for you. I do. Absolutely. 100%. I will say yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll talk. Okay. Have a good one. All right. Thanks for your time today. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found a new mindset to help you excel. For the entire bio of the Command Chief or to comment on what you learned, please visit www.tamfpodcast.com forward slash earn every day.